I'll start off. Um, first of all, thank you, Morgan, for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be back at the School of Mines. Um, this is the second time I've been here. It's probably been a, about a decade since, uh, since I was here with a, a delegation from Kazakhstan. Um, and so I'm excited to, to sort of complement my two previous presenters and, and talk a little bit about where, where we are right now. Uh, for just a, a couple minutes in terms of uh, one of the key publications that we do, which is the Statistical Review, and then sort of put a little bit of precision on some of the points that, that my two uh, co-presenters highlighted, because I think at the end of the day, um, you don't need to hear yet another uh, energy outlook. I think it's going to be helpful for us to get into a discussion later on um, and, and compare and contrast how, how we've gotten to the results that we've gotten to. So. Um, Microphone closer. Okay. So, uh, number one, we're not on a sustainable path. Last year, we saw some of the strongest growth in energy emissions and um, in energy and emissions um, that we've seen in several years. So you can see both of them moved in lockstep with one another. Um, also, here in the United States, as many of you know, we saw very, very strong growth in the United States uh, for oil and in natural gas. Uh, both happened in the same year and in the same country. Um, obviously, that's had an impact in terms of the role that we play, broadly speaking, in terms of, of exports. We've seen net imports also come down almost to zero, at least in the last couple in the last couple weeks. Um, and obviously, we've seen some improvement over the last ten years in terms of the penetration for renewables and. You can see that gas and oil share has continued to increase. Most of that is just increasing amounts of natural gas in the energy mix, um, and renewables have increased to uh, have continued to increase. So here you can see the non-fossil fuel share and renewables reaching about 10%. So the the problem though is that on a global basis, the fuel mix is basically exactly where it was in 1998. So we're seeing some positive improvements in certain countries. But unfortunately, we're basically exactly where we are, where we were um, over a decade ago. So I wanted to highlight um, one point in terms of what it might take to keep CO2 emissions flat. Um, and so what this chart is showing is in the blue, increases in energy demand. Uh, light blue is showing improvements in the fuel mix. And you can see that when it's negative, those are improvements in the fuel mix, and when it's positive, the fuel mix is moving in the opposite direction. And so what happened, what's happening here in the last several years is, as I mentioned, CO2 emissions is continuing to rise. So we, did, we constructed a thought experiment. What would it take if we wanted to keep CO2 emissions flat? Um, and so essentially what that would take, here we're showing that same graph but removing those bars, Global uh, CO2 emissions rising up into the 13, above 13 gigatons. In order to keep that flat, we could add the entire amount of renewable generation in China and the United States in 2018. That's roughly 1,000 terawatt hours of renewable generation. And we'd have to add that over the course of the last three years just to keep CO2 emissions flat. Or we could engage in a 10% switch from coal to natural gas and achieve the same result. So as my co-presenters were, were highlighting, this is a solution that is not uh, limited to one fuel. We need all sorts of fuels in order to, to achieve the decarbonization <coughs> challenge. So to, to add a little bit of precision onto the, this discussion around reducing energy poverty, achieving the, the, the sustainable development goals, any kind of solution around decarbonization needs to take both challenges into account, this dual challenge of rising population and reducing the amount of emissions that, that come as a result. So 80%, 80 percent of the population right now in the world is falling in this mix of consuming less than 100 gigajoules um, of energy per, per person. 
what if I could just put a little bit of clarity around some of these dots. So the United States is roughly 287 gigajoules per head. Nigeria, which will become the third most populous country in the world by 2050, uses seven gigajoules per head. So just think about that. You have a massive amount of population here, even if it doesn't rise at, at the same kind of, of rate that, um, that we saw in terms of, of China and India. <laughs> Uh, China, by the way, is at roughly 90, 94, 95 gigajoules per head. Um, even if it doesn't increase at that amount, it still will, will require massive amounts of energy going forward. So to try to put this into a picture, here's just sort of how some of our scenarios look. And they look very similar. I'm not going to go into all of the, the, the details because it's very similar to the way that my co-presenters have, have modeled it. So you have some scenarios where that 80% of the population um, moves down to something like 60% of the population uh, that is still consuming less than 100 gigajoules in some scenarios. And some, in some other scenarios, it's an even lower, um, a lower portion of the population that is still consuming not a lot of energy. And so that is really the spectrum that you're looking at here. You have a, a rapid transition scenario, um, and you have a more energy scenario. And if I could just show you what this looks like in terms of CO2 emissions, Here's that more energy scenario. You can see that, is this working? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see in that red line, it goes, it goes higher. In the rapid transition scenario where we have to reduce CO2 emissions by roughly 45%, um, you can see that it, it goes far lower. So much of the, this problem comes down to this picture. How do you provide uh, for more energy while reducing carbon? Um, so I'm not going to go into the individual shares of, of primary energy that, that make up this mix. You can see renewables um, increasing quite dramatically, natural gas staying a, a very important part of the mix. But the, the key point I want to make here is that in order to achieve that 45% reduction in CO2 emissions, um, much of the abatement um, is coming from power industry and buildings. It does not come from transport. So here you can see in this chart that only about 10% of the abatement um, is actually coming from the transport sector. And so that reflects the fact that, that it costs less to reduce carbon emissions in power industry and buildings, and it costs a lot more to reduce that, those carbon emissions in the transport sector. And you can see here in each of these, um, the rapid transition scenario and in the evolving transition scenario, natural gas maintains a pretty large share, and even oil um, only reduces its share by roughly, 20, by roughly four uh, percentage points versus the, the evolving transition scenario. So, um, I'm not going to go into some of these charts in terms of transport, um, but just focus specifically on oil, and maybe this will set the stage for, for further discussions into the next panel. So this is oil demand in, in the evolving transition scenario. When you look at what it might look like if we instituted a single-use plastics ban in the OECD and in the non-OECD over the course of 2030 and then 2040, respectively, you basically get a peaking in oil demand sometime between the late 2020s and early 2030s. Um, in a scenario where we banned the use of ICE vehicles, for example, in the sale of, of ICE vehicles in OECD countries by 2030 and non-OECD countries by 2040, this is what, what that looks like. And this is not additive, so that's what the ICE ban looks like. That's, and, and then in the gray, you see the single-use plastic ban. If I added them to both together and then instituted other policies in terms of a faster scrappage rate, for example, and also um, banned the use of oil in power stations, then we get to that rapid transition scenario. And so as my colleagues noted, um, here you're looking at a scenario where oil demand by 2040 is at roughly 80 million barrels a day. Now, to, for context, the sustainable development scenario that the IEA published last year shows oil demand going down into the high 70 million barrel a day range by 2040. Um, if I excluded biofuels from that, it's the low 70 million barrel a day range. Now, the issue is that if I take also the IEA sustainable development scenario um, report and I look at the, the, the calculations that they've done in terms of what the decline rate is from fields that do not see incremental investment and also 
we don't make investments in new fields, then you're looking at a, a decline rate somewhere in the range of four to four and a half percent. So as Eric mentioned, there is still a very large gap here if I'm not making any new investments in, in new fields, even if I'm wrong on this rapid transition scenario and that oil demand is still is down here in the 60 million barrel a day range, there's still going to be needed investment. Now, prices, I don't love this chart, right? It's not ideal because it doesn't actually show the picture of what the world will look like in 2040 or 2050. Prices will ensure that this gap is closed over time. And I think the other important point um, is to understand that as we look forward into, into the future, all of these climate models bring with them a great amount of uncertainty. And it's really not clear what oil demand will look like and what oil demand will look like will op and then what prices will look like is obviously going to be a function of the level of competitiveness in the market at any time. So how much cartelization is happening at any one point in time determines price and that is going to, to, um, to create a feedback loop um, and create a more and more uncertainty in terms of what this will mean for oil demand. So I think one of the things that, that my uh, colleagues will get to in, in the next panel is looking at the state of affairs in terms of the, the reduction in cost that we're seeing for, for oil production. So 25 million barrels a day of, of new production with a full cycle break even below $50 Brent. But the problem is, is that the fiscal break even for many oil producers is far above that right now, right? These fiscal break evens are points in time, they're flexible. But it still is important to understand that there's still this wide discrepancy between those fiscal break-evens and the cost of bringing on new oil, which will be a, uh, an anchor on, on where prices end up. So there's obviously um, you know, a lot of different topics that, I, that I've sort of suggested here and, and tried to highlight. I, I want to conclude with a couple open questions. So as we've shifted from a, a mode of scarcity to abundance, um, over the past 35 years or so, for every uh, one barrel of oil consumed, two have been added to estimates of proved oil reserves. And this goes back to that chart that I just showed before. So based on known oil reserves and using only today's technology, enough oil could be produced to meet the world's entire demand for oil out to 2050, uh, more than twice over. So how prices act in this age of resource abundance um, really depends on that level of competitiveness in the market and to what extent can, can this cartel-like behavior continue to work? That's an open question for, for the next panel. Um, the other question I, I have is more on behalf of some of the investors in, in our three companies. How should they be approaching the sector if the pressure has led to the pressure of sale of some of our assets? So for example, we got rid of our uh, Alaska asset in, in Prudhoe Bay. If the next owner of that asset doesn't maintain the same level of stewardship that we had in terms of environmental, environmental uh, concern, is that, is that going to create a problem? How should investors approach the, the sector? The other thing that I want to uh, highlight is, you know, as, as, uh, as Wim highlighted, we have this difference between the amount of new electricity that is going to, to come into, into being in terms of the amount of electricity demand, right? And so as electricity demand continues to increase and as this is looked increasingly as a solution to decarbonize the, the energy sector, um, how do oil and gas companies like ourselves compete with utilities that are already in that place? Um, and I think the other interesting question is that if we need to be resilient to all different outcomes uh, in terms of what the world might look like, what is the danger that we might misallocate capital um, in, the, in the future? And when we think about capital, how do we continue to attract that capital from, from those investors? Um, if those investors want a more pure exposure to the energy technologies that are driving the system. I think on that margin, that, that creates challenges for us. So um, I will conclude there because I want to make sure that we get to, to discussion. And um, thank you again.